Well, hello everyone um, and welcome to today's session. I'll be your moderator uh, for today's webinar, Understand the Power of Pharmacogenomic Testing When Treating Depression. Uh, and this is brought to you by Althea. I, I'd like to take some time to introduce uh, today's speakers. Uh, first, we have Dr. Michelle Sully reardon Dr. Reardon has over two decades experience in psychiatric medicine. She received her medical degree from Pennsylvania State University and is board eligible and board certified in pediatrics, adult psychiatry, uh, and child psychiatry. She practices at Massachusetts General Hospital for Children at North Shore and holds various positions, including 10 years uh, as the medical director of the Adolescent and Adult Partial Psychiatric Hospital Program. In addition, she is medical director for the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program and on the faculty at Tufts Medical School. We also uh, today have Dr. Banaz Sarami. Dr. Sarami is a pharmacist uh, and medical science liaison for Althea. She provides pharmacogenomics content and hosts educational webinars uh, as to the utility and clinical implications of pharmacogenomics testing. She actively interacts and fields questions from practitioners. Uh, and to further fulfill her goal and bring more awareness, she hosts the Pharmacogenomics for Pharmacists podcast uh, on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Dr. Srami will close us out uh, and will also be avail available for questions. Before we jump in, I would just like to do some housekeeping. I, I would like to provide a few additional pieces of information. A uh, recorded version of this webinar will be available on the Althea website. Uh, an email with the link will be provided to all registrants. Also, we wanna hear from all of you. Uh, you can enter questions in the chat. We'll address as many as we can uh, as time permits following the presentations. Any questions that we can't get to and we can't address, we will uh, commit to follow up with answers after the, the live event. So again, for those of you who are just joining us, welcome to Understand the Power of Pharmacogenomic Testing uh, When Treating Depression, brought to, you, brought to you by Althea. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Reardon. Uh, Dr. Reardon, if you could share your screen. So today, I apologize, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, genetic testing and in what ways can it help with the treatment of depression in patients. First of all, what, uh, what does it give us? When we do genetic testing on patients, um, what information do we get? The first thing we get is uh, individual patients' genetic response and tolerability, particularly to the SSRIs. We can actually test for two genes, one that looks at um, whether or not uh, patients will respond, a particular person will respond to the serotonin receptors, and the other one looks at whether or not they will tolerate or have increased side effects with the uh, SSRIs. We also are able to test for the presence of what we call the methyl, uh, the methylfolate reductase enzyme uh, for about 10 to 15% of people out there. Uh, there is a deficiency in that enzyme. So about 10 to 15% of people will have a deficiency in this enzyme. And the importance of that is that folate is a necessary coenzyme in making the antidepressants, uh, the, uh, particularly the SSRI. So if you have a deficiency in this enzyme, you're not as likely to respond to those medications. We also are able to tell uh, the risk of serious allergic reactions to medications, um, the HLA and HLB receptors. This is important for us uh, because lamictal in particular uh, is at risk for the uh, Stephen Johnson syndrome. Again, that's anywhere from about 10 to 15% of patients will have that gene and be at increased risk. We are able to get some information about the uh, metabolism of each of the various different cytochrome P450 enzymes. And as we know, there are several of them. And every medication has usually uh, is usually metabolized at a couple of different sites, not just one. There are some that are more important for us in the world of psychiatry, um, and we'll kind of go over some of that. Um, so we want to know what happens when certain uh, enzymes metabolize certain 
uh, antidepressants? And then what are the other drugs that may interfere with that metabolism? And then the other thing we get is informed decision on potential best choices in response to medication. Currently, the kind of standard of care is that um, most doctors have their quote unquote favorite. So sometimes it's Celexa, sometimes it's Paxil, when we don't really know whether or not that patient's gonna respond or tolerate those medications. So this just lists the overall antidepressants um, and more so on the next page, we'll see some uh, newer antidepressants that have come on the market. The most common ones we use are gonna be the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I listed those down there. I also listed the various doses um, that are there as well too. Um, I did put uh, Remeron there, even though it's a dual acting drug because it acts both on the pre-synaptic um, receptor as the post-synaptic receptor of serotonin. But in reality, it kind of acts at those two places. Luvox actually has a separate in indication for OCD. Um, and at times you may see a little indentation um, in response to the STARDI study. Um, that was a study that was done several years back uh, along with what they called the Katie study. And the Katie study looked at response and uh, practice, best practices for schizophrenia. And then STARDI looked at depression. So the ones that are noted are the ones that showed uh, better efficacy in helping patients get remission as opposed to just response. I also lift some of the dual acting drugs. Trazodone very commonly we use for sleep, um, the kind of doses you would need in order for people to uh, experience uh, depression, which trazodone is usually anywhere from 300 to 600 milligrams. And for most people, that's too sedating for them. Um, Cymbalta has a separate indication to help with pain. Um, and Wellbutrin can, um, can help with, uh, when, when you start Wellbutrin, it'll come in, it comes in a 75 milligram insta release tab, but oftentimes we'll pick the 100 milligram uh, sustain release. And I'll tell patients for the, about the first five or six days to actually cut that in half. I don't ever write that on their prescription because the pharmacist will tell them they can't do that. But in order to prevent side effects, while well, butrin can be very activating, like you drink a little too much coffee. Um, and so you want to um, make sure that you don't start too fast. And our our motto is always uh, start low and go slow with these um, antidepressants, and, and then they're really able to tolerate them. On the right, I list some of the other drugs we use that help with anxiety as well. And with my next presentation, we'll talk about um, a little bit more. But again, there are some of these medications do other things. We use prozosin for PTSD nightmares. Um, and Neurontin, which is an anti-epileptic drug, isn't a very good anti-seizure drug and isn't really a very good um, pain medicine per se, it's used for pain. So it does help um, somewhat, especially with uh, neuropathic pain, but it does have studies to show that it's effective for generalized anxiety disorder. Okay, so I list on the left here some more recent, this isn't comprehensive, but uh, these drugs actually work not just on the serotonin uh, receptor sites, but on other serotonin and HT uh, sites. So sometimes they'll block them. Sometimes they have antagonism of them. Um, they can block to other sites as uh, norepinephrine and dopamine. Uh, and a lot of this blockade of other HTA um, sites will cause or be linked with the side effects. So for example, I give you here um, Vibrid or Velazidone, and that has some side effects such as uh, GI complaints. Um, and so the HTA4, where um, it has uh, antagonism, can cause more of that. And then it can have some headaches, but there's no weight gain, which is a big one, and there's no sexual side effects. So both of those are positive. Trintelex actually can improve cognition, which is another big um, and important one as well, too. Um, the non-selective drugs are, are old um, old drugs. So they're drugs that have been around for a very long time. Although they don't have efficacy in children or adolescents, they do have very good efficacy in adults. And really what we say is um, the non-selective is they work on all of those neurotransmitters, serotonin, 
and norepinephrine and dopamine, and they uh, bind to all of those reuptake inhibitors. So they're dirtier drugs, so to speak, but because of that affinity, they work better than our more selective drugs. They also can be um, more difficult for people to tolerate as well and have more side effects. Um, they do do other things. For example, Elevil or Amtriptyline is used for pain, particularly in headaches. Um, Anaphronel is considered the gold standard for people with OCD. So if they're not responding um, to the other medications, we usually go to anaphronel. And doxepine we frequently use um, for help with sleep. Uh, uh, amipramine is used in kids to help with enuresis. And then again, some of the non-selective non drugs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Now these actually work better than any of the other drugs. They have superior efficacy in general, um, even to the tricyclics. Uh, this works by there's an enzyme inside of your neuron and that's the monoamine oxidase enzyme. And that's responsible for when the when the particular serotonin and neurotransmitters come back into a cell, they recycle them. And our brain and our body tries to be, tries to be very, um, very cautious about making sure that we're not kind of just wasting um, our neurotransmitters or other things. So it helps recycle it and helps make new, those transmitters again to then go back out to the synapse. Um, I list some of the ones that are there. Probably the biggest one we use would be Parnate. Uh, the, it's real big um, issue about uh, and limitation to using it is that it has to be uh, a very low tyramine diet. If not, then uh, you have to use a special diet, risk of hypertensive crisis. Um, you can't use them at all with any of the serotonin drugs. Uh, what will happen oftentimes is if you do, you run the risk of serotonin uh, syndrome. And uh, so you have to stop those drugs before you can start it, as opposed to what we usually do would be cross titrate those drugs over to another drug oh, and over to the MAOIs. Um, so when you want to start an MAOA, the other drug has to be gone. Um, and so the patient may experience some uh, decrease or recurrence of their symptoms because they won't have the MAOA on uh, on board. And so therefore, um, they have to wait for that medication to kick in. Um, so we use other drugs to help augment um, some of our antidepressants. Um, thyroxine, even when patients don't have any kind of thyroid issue, uh, we can use that uh, in combination. We do use obviously low doses, but that can be helpful. Now, Trexone is Narcan. Um, we will use that uh, as well. And we use Narcan to actually help with a lot of the self-injurious behaviors, cutting. Um, and we also use it to help with alcohol use. Um, so that you may see in patients. Patients always ask about supplements and vitamins and all the kind of non-drug uh, um, things that you can add. And so there are things out there um, to know about this that do really make a difference in uh, patients. One of them is magnesium. Magnesium is really good for um, all, of your, all of your body, particularly for your neuron, because what it does is it just tells those neurons to relax. Um, and so uh, in the, that happens as well in your gut and muscles and other places. Uh, the best place or the best way to get magnesium is actually not orally. Magnesium is not well absorbed in the gut. Um, and so a uh, particular kind of magnesium called ma magnesium sterate, which is the uh, best uh, kind of way or best magnesium we use for depression, um, get, a get a foot bath and soak with Epsom salt because Epsom salt is actually magnesium sterate and it gets better absorbed through the skin. Vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D, uh, we know that, and I live up in Boston, so uh, there are much higher rates of vitamin D deficiency. We have much higher rates of seasonal affective disorder, but we do know that vitamin D deficiency is associated both with uh, certain kinds of cancer, breast and colon, um, as well as depression. And for older people, it's associated with dementia or the onset of dementia. So there's some other ones. St. John's Worth is really the one you have to be careful about um, in conjunction with other medications. And then um, if you do have 
uh, deficiency in that methylfolate reductase inhibitor, then you use uh, a folate up to uh, 25 milligrams a day. And that can either be in the form of Deplin, which is actually uh, made for that purpose, or I oftentimes um, use uh, leucovorin, which is used for cancer patients. You want to use, obviously, cognitive behavioral therapy. You're going to get better response with cognitive behavioral therapy. One alone uh, does not have as good response as the other. Um, really, benzodiazepines should be uh, secondary and aren't really a uh, primary uh, drug. And the kind of uh, movement that antidepressants have really made is towards uh, directly uh, binding to the MMDA and the glutamate receptor site, what we know is kind of the end all for uh, any of this, these drugs is, is to either excite the neuron, that happens by glutamate, or tell the neuron to relax, and that happens by GABA receptors. Things like alcohol and benzo benzos act directly on that GABA site. There was a recent um, analog of uh, ketamine that came out called Spirato, and you may see this out there, um, and it's used as an intranasal spray. It has approval as an augmentation. Um, part of the issue with a lot of the uh, ketamine drugs is they're short acting, but it has been shown to have uh, increased uh, response and uh, superiority over just using your antidepressant alone. And then this patch for one of our MAO inhibitors, that may be really helpful, um, especially if you have someone with any hepatic um, uh, liver damage at all. Um, there's also a clonidine, which helps with the anxiety patch. We use it a lot in child psychiatry. You only have to change it once a week. And then there's a form of, of Prozac that has a combination of Prozac and Zyprexa. It's called Symbiax. Um, and that actually was shown in the STAR study to have um, increased efficacy as well too. Some of the other things we augment our antidepressants with uh, second generations neuroleptics, uh, including, I listed some of them. Uh, Seroquel was shown to have uh, superiority uh, for treatment of uh, chronic depression um, in conjunction with other antidepressants. But uh, this particular uh, use, I mean, we know that the neuroleptics are there to treat psychosis or mania, um, the way that uh, this uh, came about that we're using these now to help augment is that uh, a big study came out of Mass General several years back that had a combination of Prozac and Abilify and showed that people not only get better with the combination, but also get better quicker. Lithium, uh, lithium actually, we can augment lithium with other uh, antidepressants. And it shows, and actually, despite the fact that it's thought about it as a mood stabilizer, it actually has really good um, antidepressant properties to it. Uh, it also has an indication to stop people from suicide. So those patients who are on lithium tend not to hurt themselves or anyone else. I list ECT and TMS here. Uh, ECT uses electricity um, and uh, TMS uses a magnet. Uh, the one kind of uh, issue with ECT is that it has to be done in the hospital. It is very different than the ECT that we see on movies. Um, patients are actually sedated. They're paralyzed when they, they get the ECT. And pro probably the longest time they spend in the hospital, in the OR, is because of the anesthesia. And TMS, as opposed to TMS, that most of that can usually be done within an uh, office and there are you know, multiple TMS um, centers and then uh, many hospitals also have their own TMS program. There is a vagal nerve stimulator. Um, so there is a stimulator that you can put usually the point at where the stimulator uh, is attached to and you'll see is right up kind of above the clavicle uh, and that goes down it attached to the vagus nerve and basically tells your that vagus nerve to do its job. And its job is relax. Its job is get rid of stress, right? You have your neurodegenerative uh, system, uh, sympathetic nerve, and that's just gonna put you into a uh, fight or flight. And the vagal system um, does, work, does the opposite. It helps you relax and uh, helps with uh, feeling well. 
Um, I love light box therapy, like I said, up here in this area and any anywhere above 36 degrees latitude, which is wrong, like Washington, DC, uh, will uh, have increased versus a light box therapy. So we recommend that people use it for at least 30 minutes a day. They can use it longer than that. Oftentimes we, we recommend in the winter time for them to use in the morning. Um, really it's well tolerated. You don't look at the light box. You keep it within about two feet away from you. So I talk to people to, while they're working on the computer at their desk, have it sit next to them. Um, so it doesn't strain their eyes or cause a headache. We also know that exercise is really, really important in treating depression. Again, there was a large study that came out in JAMA several years uh, back that showed that exercise improves your response to antidepressants. And so we always tell our patients this, and you know, patients oftentimes feel like they don't have the energy and they can't do that or they um, don't have interest in it. And so as a result, um, if we tell them this, very oftentimes they will start to do some of this. And it's important to kind of link that for them. Meditation mindfulness, all of that stuff is really important to bring into patients' life, especially nowadays when we live in a society that moves so fast and uh, we can't really can't slow down and meditation can help ground us. So let's talk a little bit, and this is clearly not an uh, exhaustive um, presentation on the cytochrome P450 enzymes. It's really to give you some ideas of things that with it, we have antidepressants, things that can induce or inhibit those antidepressants and um, affect dosing or uh, response rate. Um, so there is a little bit of a um, mistake here in that the 2C19 should also be uh, uh, marked as a significant enzyme for the antidepressants. So people don't know this, but marijuana and nicotine are global uh, inducers of all of our enzymes in our um, liver. So what this means is and many people are vaping and do other stuff and cannabis has become increasingly popular in our society is that if you're taking a medicine, I basically tell my kids, well, you, I can give you whatever you want, but it's not gonna work because you're using these drugs that are gonna cause it to break down. Alcohol is funny. Sometimes alcohol can be inducer, but obviously as you get some dam damage to your liver, um, it's gonna inhibit medications. We all know about grapefruit, right? I, I think we always say to our patients, don't eat or take grapefruit with your medication. So that's one I think has been out there and uh, people wear very commonly. Um, some of the other things that can affect our, um, our enzymes, uh, the 2D6, uh, you have to be careful of steroids. You also have to be careful of the pseudonephrines, right? So um, when patients are using some of these drugs, you have to tell them they can't use uh, Sudafed. They have to use non-Sudafed cold medicines or allergy medicines, um, or they run the risk of uh, causing uh, issues with uh, side effects in the, um, the antidepressants not working. Um, and some other antidepressants inhibit or induce other antidepressants. So I listed here, you know, Zoloft, Elevil, Effexor are all metabolized by the 2D6, and then Prozac, Paxil, Wellbutrin can inhibit it and cause increased um, increase drug levels for those medications. St. John's wort is also there. Um, that's an important one, and that will be repeated, that uh, St. John's wort can uh, inhibit uh, the job of many of these uh, enzymes. And so um, making sure that we uh, really counsel our, our patients and that we know that we're using this because a lot of times patients won't automatically tell you. So it's important to get a list of what other herbal or over-the-counter medicines are you using. Um, caffeine uh, antibiotics uh, can be a big one uh, that will cause increased um, uh, induction and of these medications, seizure medications as well. Um, so again, there are things that we may use or that they use in psychiatry um, along with uh, the antidepressants. And so trileptal is one one, and that re really needs consideration when you're using uh, the antidepressants as well too. Minofidil is a um, narcolepsy drug. 
it had a study many years back that looked at it for ADHD and unfortunately didn't get the F a, uh, FDA approval, but it has been used as an off one treatment for ADHD. And ORUP is one of the first generation neuroleptic medications that have superiority in the treatment of uh, Tourette's disorder. So if people aren't um, responding to other medications that we use for tics and Tourette's, then they would use ORUP. And then um, again, uh, some of the other uh, medications, the antibiotics, oral concepts, uh, the pill and oral contraceptive pills can really affect um, and inhibit or induce uh, some of these uh, antidepressants as well. And then Zantec isn't on the market anymore, but the, uh, the H2 histamine uh, receptors in your gut um, right now, Pepsid is probably the main one we use can also cause um, is issues with increasing doses. Um, again, I just some of the other ones, uh, be careful of things, uh, be careful of some of the, uh, especially longer acting benzodiazepines, which can cause uh, people to suffer with um, more side effects with, uh, with their antidepressants. Um, the antifungal medications, again, we mentioned steroids in St. John's Worth. One important inhibitor for many of uh, these drugs is methadone. Um, and so methadone is commonly used, particularly in women who are pregnant because it's actually the safest thing for them to use when they're pregnant, suboxone is not. And so you may have a woman who's on one of these medications, Celexa, um, and what we know that is when women get pregnant, they have a much higher volume of distribution. So, you know, they may not be uh, responding as well to that selexa, but then you have methadone come along and it's going to inhibit that metabolism. And so again, you run the risk of more side effects or more difficulty tolerating those medications. Okay, again, just looking at some more specific antidepressants and kind of what other antidepressants or drugs uh, they may affect. So Prozac can inhibit one of the second generation neuroleptics, Risperidone. We use Risperidone actually very commonly, um, particularly in kids. And so the, the Risperidone has actually been shown uh, and has an FDA indication in kids with autism and decreasing uh, movability and aggression. Um, so commonly we may use that, but in using that, you're gonna inhibit Risperidone and that will lead to decreased metabolism with potential for increased side effects. Now, the neuroleptics, some of the biggest side effects you have to watch out for are what we call the extra pyramidal side effects. So there are things like muscle stiffness, muscle soreness, um, the uh, TV, tardive dyskinesia, um, or dystonia. And so you may see that, you know, maybe the patient was on Zoloft and then you have to, and you switch them over to Prozac and all of a sudden the Risperidone that we, they were taking is um, causing some of these side effects that you didn't have. Again, grapefruit juice, you really have to be um, careful about that, but uh, it does specifically inhibit use bar. And so you'll get decreased metabolism um, in that. And use bar is a serotonin like drug. It, does be, it doesn't bind to uh, the SSRI um, reuptake inhibitor, but it does bind to a couple of the other 5H, uh, 5-HA uh, TA sites, so um, that, that can be affected as well too. Um, Lamictal, so that's a big one that we have to be mindful of. So Lamictal um, has a relationship with the oral contraceptive pill. So the oral contraceptive pill can cause decrease in Lamictal levels. So that may mean that a patient who has seizures or is doing well um, with their mood, all of a sudden the level drops and they lose that efficacy and or they have a seizure. Um, so they can very have a seizure. Um, and we have to make sure that we can counsel patients on there's a risk of uh, pregnancy. And like I said, um, seizures as well. And then I just some of the other ones. Again, St. John's Ward is a big one you have to worry about. Okay, so I'm going to uh, move this over to Dr. Sarami. One thing I will say before um, she st starts to kind of give you examples and actually show you uh, the testing, uh, 
the mistake that a lot of people do make when they take a look at this testing is that um, they will kind of go by, it's usually listed as green, yellow, and then red. Um, and so people say, well, the green, I'm gonna use the green only. And that's not really true. You can certainly use the other medications. You just may have to adjust doses for those other medications. Dr. Sharami, do you wanna take, um, take it over? Excellent, Dr. Uh, Reardon, thank you very much. We have a couple of questions. I'll remind everybody if you have additional questions, uh, please put them in the chat uh, and or in the Q&A, uh, and we will address those at the conclusion of Dr. Uh, Sarami's talk. So with that, Dr. Sarami, uh, would you like to share your screen? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reardon, for that presentation. Thanks, everybody, for being here. My name is Fana Sarami. I'm the pharmacist and medical science liaison for Althea DX. So here at Althea DX, our goal is to support the provider so they can help their patients get to their right medication faster. Uh, we know depression is very prevalent, and especially, unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 that has been really exacerbated. And as Dr. Reardon was talking about all those medications that are possible for patients to be on, but selecting the right one is really a little bit challenging. So what's current, the current prescribing model is really trial and error. So for example, when a patient comes in based on their specific condition and provider clinical judgment, uh, let's say um, they they're, have depression and antidepressant A selected and they're told to come back in about a month or two, see how that works out for them. And, um, According to, like Dr. Ridgen was talking about STAR-D trial, which is one of the largest clinical trials of depression, one of their findings was about 50% of people don't respond the first time around for the antidepressant. So they either augmented with another medication or switched over to antidepressant B. And they're told again to come back in about a month or two and see how that works. So the cycle kind of continues to kind of keep going until the right medication is selected. So what pharmacogenomics does is combines the science of pharmacology and genomics. So the per, there's a personalized medication selected based on their genes. And so that, that takes away from that amount of time it takes a patient to become mentally stable. This is our PGX report called ID Genetics. It's just a small sample, the depression sample. But how it's laid out is if you look on the left-hand side on the green a heading underneath that, these are all the medications that either don't have a drug-drug interaction or drug-gene interaction. And on the right side, underneath the orange or light brown, depending on what color you see, those do have a drug-drug interaction or drug-gene interaction. And so as Dr. Reardon was talking uh, about the red, yellow, green, we try to stay away from the those boxing. So when, when providers are looking at a specific box color, let's say red or green, they're not either selecting from a green box and avoiding everything from a red box. So there's still a lot of clinical um, indication and value that has to be set to pick a medication, not from just a raw report. And so our, our uniqueness in the ID genetics is we're very comprehensive in our report. So if you look at the, uh, on the right-hand side where escitalopram is uh, right here, we give the, there's the phenotype, um, it says 2C19 for metabolizer. There's the comprehensive report where it says you can either decrease the dose or adjust the dose or use an alternative medication. It tells you where the guidelines were selected from, the CPIC guidelines or the uh, reference PubMed ID. And this, the black section on top, it just really means the patient is actually on that medication. So versus the ones below is if the patient were to select these, if a provider were to select these medication, there's some caution that needs to be looked at. And the other, um, the other thing you need to Althea DX is the drug-drug interaction piece on the bottom. Um, and that's really important because we know a lot of patients are on multiple medications, especially the elderly. It doesn't say a lot of details in that section because as we know, there are sometimes clinical indication where a patient can be on two medications, although there's some drug drug, drug drug interaction right there. But it gives, it brings attention to the provider with that's uh, something to look at and be cautious of. And the other thing with the drug drug interaction piece, and Dr. Rita mentioned that earlier as well, is the idea of phenylconversion to also be mindful of. So if a person is a normal metabolizer of 2D6 and they're on tramadol, let's say for pain, and we add on a Prozac for depression, and 
we just pheno, because they're both using the same SEP enzyme, we just pheno converted the patient to a poor metabolizer and they can't get any more pain relief. So all these things have to be taken into account for when we're looking at a PGX report. And again, the PGX is kind of a tool to use to guide therapy. So we, you know, selecting the right medication sooner. So we cutting back or shortening that time the patient becomes mentally stable. And so this is our gene panel. If you look, we have the pharmacokinetic enzyme, which are the SIP enzymes, and the pharmacodynamic enzymes as well. And on the bottom, the MTFHR that Dr. Reardon was talking about. And we also have the Breer's criteria. So if you go look back on here, we have some of the medications, they have a number one on them. So those are on Breer's criteria. That just means a list of inappropriate medications for a patient's age over 65 because of either anticholinergic effects or risk for falls that um, it's, it's there for pay, uh, providers to also be aware of. So again, the PGX is another piece that um, should be used to guide therapy to get patient mentally stable sooner. So with that, I turn it over for questions you guys might have for myself or Dr. Reardon. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sarami. Thank you, Dr. Reardon. So again, if there's any last minute questions, uh, I'll encourage you all to put them in the Q&A. Um, at this point in time, um, I, I, I apologize if anyone had any audio difficulties. I, I saw a couple of mentions of that in the chat. Uh, the audio was okay on our side. So we will be posting uh, these slides uh, as well as the recorded webinar and everyone who registered will get that link. Uh, so hopefully, uh, if there was anything that was missed and, and was frustrating, you can hear that in the recording. Um, but if there's any specific questions, we have a couple of moments. Uh, if you would like to enter those in the Q&A or, or the chat, uh, or if there's any further comments. Um, with that, uh, I think there was one question, and I, I, I don't know who this would go to. I believe this is probably... Dr. Reardon, but it was a question uh, related to, I thought Epsom salts were magnesium sulfate, not stearate. Is, is that uh, something that Dr. Reardon would like to address? So yes, I'm, I misspoke on that. Um, oh. It is magnesium, uh, magnesium sulfate. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, uh, fantastic. Well, with that, um, if there is not any other questions, anything that appears in the Q&A or the chat, um, we would absolutely uh, intend on addressing and we will reach out to you directly. Um, and thank you very much for uh, our presenters and thank you uh, for everyone who attended. Uh, and uh, we, we will conclude with that. Thank you.